So let's kick off. So um, as I said, my name's Harry. Um, I've been in uh, the investment and financial planning industry for about 20 years. Actually, it'll be 20 years next month. Um, and uh, it's kind of broken into two parts. The first phase of my career, the first 10 odd years, was in um, private client advice. So with the likes of KPMG and Crow Howard. So I guess you could call that the upper end of the market, high net worth, business people and the like. And then after about uh, in 2007, I moved across to institutional asset consulting. And that's with an American firm called Mercer. Um, and there I dealt with superannuation funds, um, advising them how to create uh, portfolios and select fund managers and the like. So what I'm going to do today is talk to you about, well, a little bit about Clover, but let's save that for the end. What is Clover? Um, in case you don't know, it's, it's what's known um, in the US as, a ro as robo advice. So it's a platform basically that gives you a lot of the interaction that you would get from a financial planner without having to go see a financial planner. So you interact with the portal, you obviously tell the portal a little bit about yourself, and then you get some advice in relation to your specific requirements. Um, so I'll show you some screens at the back end, but I, I won't hold up uh, the presentation because we want to get to the, the key things about the presentation. And, and we're going to cover four key things in the session. As I said, it is a 101. It's, uh, it's high level, but it is some of the key foundations for wealth. In fact, the amazing thing I found over the years is that I basically saw two sorts of clients in that, those first 10 years as a wealth advisor. The first sort of client were basically clients that were already fabulously wealthy. They didn't really need advice on how to get wealthy because they came with enormous wealth. So their, their key requirements were kind of how do I keep it, how do I pass it on to my kids, and can I do some really cool sexy investing that I can brag about with my mates at the golf course on a Sunday. Pretty much, that, that's, that's the private wealth space. The other sorts of clients which really did trouble me were clients who came to me with more modest means and they came to me of, oftentimes really late in life, mid-40s, generally and beyond, because financial planning in Australia really is about retirement planning for the most part. That's the way the industry is set up to give you retirement advice. And clearly, these people could have been better off had they just started earlier or had they just built some of the financial building blocks earlier on in their lives. And so I became really curious as to how we could do that. Um, and really, without technology, there really was no way to do that. So the key thing about robo-advice and why I'm really passionate about it is it helps people to get sorted with their finances earlier on in life. And the, the key part of those finances are getting these four things under control. In fact, unless you can kind of do the first two and get the third one under control, you've pretty much got no shot at the fourth. So let's kick off. Do you have financial goals? Um, when I ask people this question, it's kind of, yeah, but not really. It's kind of this amorphous concept. What are financial goals? Well, I guess Lewis Carroll uh, in Alice in Wonderland put it best when he said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, right? So you kind of need a road map. Um, it doesn't need to be super specific and detailed down to, down to individual streets, but you kind of need a big picture of where you're going. And some of the goals that, that oftentimes I hear, especially when I talk to the younger cohort, so millennials into Xs, uh, these sorts of things. And I guess they are set out in chronological order because these are the, the, the problems that we face generally in life, right, as we go through it. So you, you start adulting and you get a credit card, you get a job, and then how do you control that? Um, oftentimes, especially these days, you, you, you dream about the six months overseas, kind of just bumming around Europe or, or, or sort of backpacking through South America. Then you get a bit serious, you partner up and there's the wedding and how do you fund that? Um, and the big one, the big one for millennials um, and, and let's face it, even some exes now is the home deposit. This is a fundamentally different problem to when I was saving for a deposit. When sort of 18 months with a high interest savings account got the job done comfortably. Now the stats are basically, depending on the state you live in and whether you're partnered or single, it's anywhere from about two years to about 8.3 years to save up for a home deposit. And that's pretty scary. How does that happen? And then you nest and you settle down and the kids come along and, and it's, it's different trade-offs for education and, and how do you fund that if you choose to go more towards the private end of the scale. All the while you've got, obviously now, you've got the big um, mortgage hanging over you and it's no longer the sort of 
mortgage that your parents took out is now a beast of a, a thing, 850, 900,000 potentially. It's, it's not unusual, uh, especially in big cities like Melbourne and Sydney. In fact, an interesting stat, I'm not sure, you, you might have seen this floating around the internet, uh, they drew a sort of a, a $600,000 boundary around Melbourne um, and it was really interesting to see where you could get a property in Melbourne for less than 600000 and basically it was nowhere inside 15 k's of the city. Um, so, so those are the sorts of, of things that people are grappling with. All the while you're, talking to, you're looking at the concept of financial independence and that ultimately is getting to a stage in your life where you have choices, right? You have choices about the work you do, where you work, how much of it you do, uh, because you have sufficient assets, you have converted all the skills that you have and are still to develop, the human capital as it's called, by economists into financial capital. And that's the key thing, that conversion process, making that as efficient as possible so that you do have choices, hopefully er earlier on in life and, and not having to wait you know, to your late 60s and early 70s. So let's start with the very foundation piece, saving. If you can't save, you'll never get ahead. And, and, and um, I like to tell this story because it, it, it really did open my eyes about the importance of, of saving. Um, you don't get wealthy by spending money. Or uh, another way of putting it is that, as a general rule, expenditures rise to meet incomes. You start off in the workforce, you work hard, you get a better job, all of a sudden you're eating out at a slightly more fancy restaurant, or you're eating out a little bit more frequently. The holidays are not so much budget, they're just a little bit fancier. There's no end to the ways in which you can spend money. And actually, I ha had a client back in my private wealth days who uh, was extremely successful in his profession and on a good year would make a million dollars. Now, if you're grossing a million, I'm sure you're probably taking home net 600 or so, but that's a fair bit of coin. You would think that you wouldn't have any issues if you're, if you're netting 600,000 and, you know, it's kind of like my future is sorted. Not so, this person still had, had all sorts of problems, came to me sort of in, in thankfully in their early 40s, but was nowhere was, was nowhere on track for a financially independent retirement before 60. Just because all of that 600k was effectively pre-spent. If you are in a, that sort of profession and you're earning those sorts of dollars, you have to drive the European car, you've got to live in Brighton, the kids have got to go to a certain school, and on and on and on it goes, and you've got to be a member of a certain golf club, 600k spent easily. So one of the things that I'm really passionate about is getting people to think about this spending earlier on in life because it's by controlling that, the difference between what you bring home and what you spend gets you on that conversion journey to convert all your skills into, into financial wealth. First things first though, let's, before we race ahead, start with the foundations. If you don't have a simple emergency fund, simple bank account, money under the mattress, not fast, but a simple emergency fund that you can access at the drop of a hat you will be in strife. They did a survey in the US last year and they asked uh, Americans generally um, at what point would they feel under financial stress. 46% of Americans would not be able to find $400 for an emergency spend if they needed to. And yet these people were saying, well, I've got a job, I'm fine, things kind of tick along. But $400 was the tipping point which would put 46% of Americans into financial stress. Personally, I think you should have uh, an emergency fund which is some multiple of your take-home pay, two months, three months, four months, whatever, but get that started because um, you just never know when you'll need it. Interesting story, if anyone is interested in the startup space, I had to bootstrap this startup for a good seven months before we got funded, so I had to have a significant emergency fund uh, and obviously, I'm, you know, being a financial planner, I was fairly dis disciplined about saving, but that was what it took me to get, uh, to get this uh, puppy off the ground. So set savings goals, right? It can be simple, it can be complex, but it can be as simple as by Christmas, I'll have a Christmas kitty to meet all my, my, my Christmas um, you know, save, um, presents needs because I don't want to have that horrific credit card bill come January. Fine, that's a goal. If you're saving for a bigger, chunkier goal, like a, like a holiday, um, then obviously you, you want to set that down. When are you going? Where are you going? What's your budget? So creating budgets, um, it's critical. You do it in big businesses like this. Your CFO, no doubt, has a very detailed budget as to how the cash flow will come in and out of Redbubble for the next 12 months. 
you should have a similar one in, in a much simpler version for your personal life. Pay yourself first. Mo more often than not, money comes in, hits a bank account, and as I said, it's either pre-spent or it's like, yep, we're off for drinks on a Friday night, and Saturday morning you wake up with a massive head hangover going, um, where did that money go, right? So one of the things you want to try to do, ideally, is to pay yourself first, and, and you know, it's whatever amount is you've set aside for savings, sweep that to a facility. Um, obviously, we've built our technology to, com to, to accommodate that, but the idea is to just make sure that you pay yourself first, so you're sorted, and then you deal with the, the, other, the other bits in life. If you do that, it's amazing how fast you will not feel that money that's been swept away. It's kind of like out of sight, out of mind, and you will just very quickly gravitate to living with the rest of the money, which is truly your spending money, right? So that's, that's an important concept. Spend less than you make and put the, the rest to work. It's, it's pretty easy to say, it's pretty hard to do, uh, but it's, it's the core of, of, of uh, savings. Now debt, debt is good and it can be bad. It, it, it's this yin and yang of debt. You can earn a truckload of money and then get into a whole lot of debt and then get into a whole lot of trouble, like uh, Kanye, um, who is $53 million in debt, and I'm not sure whether he's worked his way out of it as yet. But there is, as I said, good debt and there's bad debt. Um, good debt, ideally, is debt that you're taking on to fund a productive asset. So you could say, well, my home loan, my home is going to be something that I will raise kids in, ultimately retire in, it's a roof over my head. Um, yep, fine, that, that's good debt. Uh, bad debt, obviously, is debt that's funding assets that are going to depreciate in value. So if anyone thinks that their cool new car, uh, that they've got a massive um, car loan on, is an asset, it's actually on the balance sheet, I'd put that as a, as a liability. It's a lifestyle asset, because it makes you feel cool when you drive it, but it's a, it's a financial liability, because that thing is depreciating the moment you drive it out of the showroom and keeps depreciating, whereas that interest just keeps, uh, keeps accumulating. And as a general rule, especially for home loans, um, especially when, when, when interest rates were a little bit higher, not so much now, but if you were borrowing a dollar, you were repaying back two over 25 to 30 years. So think about that. We've got this double whammy where you're having to take out massive home loans now, but then you're effectively doubling that for what you pay back to the bank. What I really do um, find annoying is um, high, high interest rates when the cash rate is so low. So first point we've covered, don't use debt to buy frivolous stuff. Think about it uh, before you, you pull out your credit card. Pay down your highest interest rate debt first and that is without a shadow of, the, of a doubt your credit card. Um, it's quite stunning actually. I, I pulled out my credit card uh, statement just on Sunday night to have a look at the effective rate because I don't pay interest because me and my wife are assiduous in paying out the full balance every month. I think we've maybe paid interest once in 15 years. But I thought I'm going to present. Um, I should probably know what the current interest rates are on credit cards. Anyone have any idea what like an average credit card interest rate is at the minute in Australia? 20. Bingo, yeah, mine was like 20.95, something like that. That's insane. That is insane given that banks are basically funding at about 2, maybe 3% tops. So for financial institutions, when you pay credit card um, interest, that's money for jam. They couldn't be happier. Um, and in fact, it, there's a fair bit of behavioral finance that goes into the way those credit card statements are actually designed so that you are drawn to pay the minimum amount and not the full amount. If you do, it kind of gets really hard to build wealth uh, with, with the other, other sort of foundation pieces that I'll be talking about. Also, are you prepared for an interest rate rise? Look, um, I came from a time when I, well, I did banking and finance, so I've been tracking interest rates for a long time. Uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, they were up to like 17%. Thankfully, those days are gone. Uh, you'd hate to be borrowing uh, uh, for a home at 17%. They're now, what, 45 maybe 5%, depending on the bank you go with. But you should be prepared for a time when interest rates will start to normalize because they're at 4.5% because of the GFC, right? So the global financial crisis hit in 2007, 2008, and all the central banks just said, let's lower rates right down to try to energize economies. There will be a time when those, those central banks and the US central banks started doing it last year, will start to normalize rates. The RBA will do it here. They had a meeting yesterday. They kept it at 1.5%. That's our official cash rate. That's a historic low. So you've got to figure at some point, 
those rates will start bubbling up and they will percolate through to all rates, including home loan rates. So those four and a half to fives won't stay around forever and you've got to be uh, able to, to withstand a, a rate rise, even if it's a modest 1%. So you have those foundations. You've, you've got your savings under control. You've got your debt under control. Um, let's move on to investing. This is the fun bit, right? This is kind of like uh, the, the thing that everyone wants to get to. But there are very many traps to avoid before you, you go sort of headlong into investing. Uh, first trap to avoid, and we'll, we'll look at some data on this, is basically the problem that I used to see way too often. People are just starting too late. Um, the journey is best started really in your 20s. 30s, okay, uh, but if you leave it into your 40s, that's, um, that's problematic, and I'll show you some evidence as to why. D putting all your eggs into one basket, the concept of insufficiently diversifying, um, uh, chasing returns, kind of buying last year's winners, because oftentimes markets revert, so what was last year's winners may actually end up being this year's loser. Loss aversion, basically panicking when, when, when things start to go a little bit um, haywire. Um, as a lot of people did in the GFC um, and to their cost. And then the one that simply isn't highlighted enough in, in uh, the financial industry is hidden fees. This is something that once again I'm really passionate about because I kind of know as an insider all the layers of fees that, that are stacked onto um, people's uh, balances and, and how erosive that can be. Um, in fact, it, it's, ki it's kind of like termites. Uh, John Oliver, if, if you follow him on, on HBO or on YouTube, um, has, a, has a brilliant video on, on um, fees and retirement accounts, which I um, highly recommend you YouTube and have a look at. So rule number one, starting too late, right? So start early. This is simply the magic of compound interest. Einstein called it uh, one of the greatest forces in the universe. Um, and it's true because it's just growth on growth. So you start with a dollar, it compounds at, at 10%, get to a dollar 10, if it compounds at 10%, it doesn't go to a dollar 20, it goes to a dollar 21, and so on and so forth. So it's growth on growth. This is just a simple concept of, of how you need time for compounding to really work its, its magic. If you start with $500 a month, saving that, and let's assume a 6% rate of return, which is not unrealistic if you're, if you're balancing your portfolio of cash with some shares and some property and some bonds. Away you go. So you start in your 20s doing that. And by the time you're 60, you may have in the region of $1.4 million. You delay it by a decade. You start when you're age 30 and that 1.4 is halved. So it's only about $700,000. You delay it a further decade and you start in your 40s and that's effectively halved again to $350,000. So you've missed out on a million bucks by, uh, by not, not starting earlier. Um, interestingly enough, everyone knows Warren Buffett. We're going to see a little quote from Warren Buffett in a little while. Uh, the richest investor now worth $74 billion US, so that's about $95 billion Australian, give or take. Most of that wealth he actually accrued after the age of 60. He's now, what, 86, 87? But it's just the compounding effect. He was well and truly a billionaire by the time he was 60, but it's that compounding of that wealth over time, over the last 20 odd years, that's really taken him into the stratosphere. So yes, that's why we kind of said get, get rich slow uh, as, the, as the, the, the title to the presentation because you need the time to do it. And those who take shortcuts are the ones who we tend to find uh, get into trouble. This is one that sort of flies in the face of most of my friends at Mercer and most of the people in the financial industry, they truly believe that they can pick stocks or pick an asset class or, you know, sh um, property is hot this year, but next year it'll be shares, so I'll flip. And then the year after it'll be, I don't know, Bitcoin and the year after that. So I, I'm kind of going to move in and out. The only ones that generally win from that are those that are facilitating that movement. So it's the brokers, it's the financial planners, it's those that actually benefit from activity or hyperactivity really in, in some cases. That, that's what they want. The vast majority of the academic evidence, and this is going back to the 60s, suggests that it is virtually impossible for any one person to beat the markets over time. Really no one has done it and everyone says, yeah, but Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett hasn't done it by being a, a traditional investor in the way you and I are. He's gone out and bought companies. So that, that's a little bit of a, a different beast. <coughs> so 
don't pick shares or don't pick bonds or don't pick properties. Try to diversify and use index funds instead. Index funds are a bit of a revolution. They have been around for about 40 years, but these are just funds that try to mimic a particular index and they do it at extremely low cost and we'll see very soon why that is such a massive advantage. So um, when everyone turns on the TV in the evenings and they, they've got Alan Kohler talking about the way the market went this evening, he's generally referring to an index and in Australia the most common one is the S&P ASX 200. There's also an S&P ASX 300 but as you can imagine either the 200 largest companies in Australia or the 300 but an index if you are invested in an index that might track those funds would pretty much buy the same shares uh, in the same pro rata amounts. So here's some evidence, right? So try to win and you will probably end up losing. So um, this is evidence for the, um, the, the latest um, report by S&P that keeps a track on these things. Five years to the middle of last year. Of all the funds, and there are thousands of them in Australia that tried to beat the S&P ASX 200 index, only 30% did. Of all the funds that tried to beat the International Shares Index, about 8% did. Uh, for bonds, it was 11.3%, and for property, it was about 8%. So um, from an after, after fees perspective especially, and also after tax, because active funds, funds like these tend to turn over their, their, their uh, investments a lot trying to eke out those uh, additional gains. Um, it tends to be a bit of a losing game. And it's put nicely by Warren Buffett in this particular um, quote. By periodically indexing in, in an index fund, the know-nothing investor can actually outperform most investment professionals. Um, there's, a, there's a study that, that we looked at recently and we actually wrote a blog piece about it that just went up um, late last week. Um, on indexing and basically about 0.6%, so statistically it's almost irrelevant, but less than 1% of fund managers have been demonstrated over time to be able to outperform and deliver real value. John Oliver, um, I love this quote, it's, uh, this is his take on indexing. It's basically the plot of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. If you stick around doing nothing while everyone around you stuffs up, you're going to win big. It's kind of the philosophy, the overriding philosophy of Clover. It's kind of like, let's not get on, onto that bandwagon of trying to be smarter than the next guy. Let's just kind of sit there and harness the wisdom of the crowds and effectively uh, free ride our way to greater wealth. Why did I talk about cost b b before? Because it is so erosive. As I said, it's kind of like, well, rust for your, your portfolio or, or termites even, but w whatever analogy you want to use. Here's the difference in just a flat $50,000 being invested for a long period of time. And let's face it, we're all investors for the next, till we're 80, 70, 80. The life expectancy for the average Australian, depending on whether you're male or female, is between 84 and 86. Uh, so you will be an investor for multiple decades, even if you do nothing other than have your money just sitting in a super fund. You are an investor. That, that fund uh, will, will charge you fees. You go with a financial planner, that planner will charge you fees. Um, and those fees add up. So we're looking at a difference of 1% in fees over five decades. And it is horrendous because that 50,000 at a 1% fee levy grows to almost a million dollars. That same 50,000 at a 2% fee levy grows to just a little over half a million. So that, that's the, the take that, the, uh, that someone else has um, that, that you don't have in your pocket. So once again, we're really passionate about trying to obviously um, reduce the experience of our clients down towards the 1% level, or rather than what the industry standard is, unfortunately, is anywhere from 2 to 3. And interestingly enough, this is actually backed up by the regulator, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. When you go into their website and go to the advice page and look at the costs of getting advice, they quote a 2% fee. And uh, from what I've seen with, with my past experience, it's actually a little bit higher. Elise Applin, our product manager, formerly of ThoughtWorks. Um, diversify, right? So one of the annoying things about being in finance is that you kind of uh, realize that the financial industry is set up to make things massively complex. And that complexity is quite self-serving, I'll have to admit. Because the more complex you make something, the more people feel that they can't do it themselves or can't access it. So they need expertise, and the next thing you know, they're paying 2% fees, right? So 
in essence, investing comes down to just how you place your money intelligently in about four buckets. These are the buckets that are, that are um, available to every person in the room here. It's not rocket science, you can get access to any of this. So everyone knows cash. Cash is, well, kind of not just coins and, and notes uh, in, in your wallet uh, or under the mattress, but it's slightly more sophisticated short-term products that banks trade with each other. Uh, but generally, the rate of return on cash is the cash rate. So one and a half to two percent is where you're at about now. Property, everyone knows property because, hey, we all live in one, whether we're renting it or we're paying it down or it's our parents or whatever. But um, property, as institutional investors do, it is more like buildings like this and your local Bunnings warehouse and, you know, and Melbourne Airport and, and big chunky pieces of property that, that aren't uh, residential. Bonds um, are IOUs basically from governments and companies. So you give them uh, some money, they pay you back that money and give you some interest regularly and then at the end of the term give you the money back and shares everyone knows about shares. But it's worth mentioning that effectively shares when you think about it are just a form of ownership. So if you own shares, you are a part owner in a business. And it may be the business you work in through an IPO, it may be just some shares you bought uh, following a tip from a friend on the ASX. You are a part owner in a business. Now, the difference between bonds and shares is simply this. Let's assume there's a company that you're really interested in, right? So you have a choice of either buying the, the shares in the company or the bonds issued by that company. Right, so now you could buy $1,000 worth of shares in that company or you could buy $1,000 worth of bonds in that company. Now, best case scenario for that company, it turns out to be the next Amazon or the next Netflix, right? Go through the roof, you're sitting on lots of money, fantastic. It's a punt because by the same token, that company could end up being the next Pets.com. Pets.com actually was a thing in the 1990s in the uh, dot-com bubble. Um, it didn't survive, Amazon did. Uh, it was a close run thing for both of them, but unfortunately pets.com didn't. But so you have this, this outcome where you can, you can go to zero or can go potentially through the roof. Bonds, if you had the same uh, bonds in that company, they would pay you a rate of return depending on what the market rate is. And in the extreme case, if, if the company did go under, you would be ahead of a shareholder in terms of getting your money back. You're a secured creditor, right? So between those two bets that you're taking in the same company, which do you think you should get the higher return from? Any ideas? Given, given, given the, the bet that you're taking on the shares, it could go to zero, or it could go through the roof, or you're getting a, a return that's kind of known from a bond. Between those two, you should really be getting a higher return on shares, right? Because you're taking more risk with the shares. So in a normal environment, shares are your highest returning asset class, but the risk is, because things could go to zero, bonds are less risky and property and cash. Um, property is, is equally, I guess, with shares a, a, a growth asset, so it has some risk with it, but cash and bonds are your less uh, risky assets. The point of all of that is this chart. It's often called a, a quilt, an asset allocation quilt, or periodic table of asset returns. And the point of that is it's really, really hard to pick winners from one year to the next. So there you have returns from the different buckets, although there are a few more, there are a few more granular buckets, like we've broken up international shares into small countries like emerging markets, and we've broken up international shares into currency hedged, where you don't take any currency risk, and currency unhedged. But the bottom line is those four buckets are basically replicated here in the columns and across as you go through time, you see that the returns are fairly random. So your best defense against that randomness, unless you are the guru who can pick ahead of time which one will perform better, and there's no evidence that that can be done, is to diversify to create a portfolio with a little bit of each, depending on your own personal circumstances. Rule number five, and this goes back to um, one of the, the, uh, the founders of, of that, the, the largest index fund in the world, John Bogle, said the two biggest enemies of the individual investor are emotions and expenses. We've covered the expenses bit. We can, we, we've already seen how, how 
damaging that can be over time. Emotions can do equally as much damage. So this is kind of the, the way a lot of people, especially younger investors who are new to markets, um, tend, tend to react to financial markets because they go up, they go down. In 2007 and 8, they went down a lot. And then in 2009 onwards, they recovered a tremendous amount. So on the way up, people get envious about, you know, markets that are going up, friends that are cashing in and they're being left out. And at some point, you tend to go, you know what, I'm in. And then markets invariably turn, especially share markets, which I said are more volatile because companies have good times and then they go through bad times. Economies have good times and, and equally have difficult times. You have a downturn and the next thing you know, it's kind of like at some point, your money is going backwards, you are losing money, you're losing sleep and you go help. And then at another point further down, you go, I'm out. Fairly typically, this is counter cyclically to how the markets then behave because people tend to get out and then markets recover. So no surprises, the GFC kind of started, and I just joined Mercer, interestingly enough, kind of probably in 2007. So this is kind of like 2007. This was 2008 where it literally looked like the whole financial world would just melt. This was when companies were being bailed out, governments were panicking and, and lowering rates effectively to zero. And this was March 2009, the very low point. And by then, a lot of money had moved out of the market and gone to cash, which governments had accommodated by effectively lowering the rate to zero. So all this cash came in for a 0% rate of return. And then markets subsequently went roaring back from 2009 through to now. So it's, it's really, really hard, but the numbers are in, um, ladies and gents. This is the um, outcome from your financial perspective of, of th that emotional roller coaster and not being able to have a longer term discipline approach to it. So there's a company in the US called Delba who run a report every year and they basically look at exactly what I just showed you. The flows of money depending on the timing and, and the way the markets are. So they've quantified the fact that money comes rushing in as markets go up and then money goes rushing out the door as markets tank. And they looked at 20 years worth of data, uh, and this is to the end of 2015, that suggested that the broadest index in the US for the stock market is the S&P 500. That had generated a return of 9.85% per annum for that entire period. However, the average investor in a, in a fund that was trying to get a return equivalent to the S&P 500 or better, actually generated a return of only 5.2%. So that gap effectively was the result of, of um, not being able to stay the course. And we find it kind of um, really, really important that people who come into investing, if you're gonna get the benefit of those 40 years, getting your $500 a month through to you know, a, a, a nice comfortable figure over a million, the benefit is really in staying the course um, rather than, than bailing out when, when times seem tough. Well, uh, I will wrap it up. If, if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll be hanging around for a few minutes after this. Feel free to come up and, and chat one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.